Hi there, my name is Josiah, and in this video, we will be looking at some of the physiologic effects hydrotherapy infers, such as augmenting circulation, increasing immune system function, heat shock proteins, and FOXO3 proteins. Also, if you learned something in this video, consider hitting the like or subscribe button. It lets YouTube know that we're producing quality content and good information. Enjoy! Hydrotherapy is the use of water for both the treatment and prevention of disease, along with increasing physical performance and quickening the rehabilitation process. Water offers various advantages, including being abundant, not physiologically irritating, and having an excellent solvency, excellent viscosity, high heat capacity, and high heat conductivity. In this video, we will give a brief overview of some of the physiologic responses hydrotherapy infers, especially in external hot and cold applications. Heat therapy can be explained partially by vasodilation, which facilitates blood flow, increasing nutrient perfusion, hemofluidity, and vascular endothelial function, while cold therapy is explained by vasoconstriction and pain reduction due to the reduction in nerve conductive velocity and inhibiting of nociceptors. So vasodilation is the dilation of blood vessels, which decreases blood pressure, and vasoconstriction is the constriction of blood vessels, which increases blood pressure. We can do our own experiment with, experiment with two basins of water, one hot and the other cold. As the warmth of the water causes the smooth muscles in my blood vessels to relax, there is an increase in volume within the lumen, and that results in a higher concentration and perfusion of blood in that area. Conversely, the cold causes the smooth muscles to contract, which pushes the blood away from that area, back to the heart. So due to the pressure produced by the left ventricles of my heart and the one-way valves in the veins, the blood circulates in one continuous direction. By appropriately using these two physiologic principles, it enables one to increase circulation systemically or locally, depending on where and how the heart are being applied. Essentially acting as a thermal pump and aiding the heart in circulating blood while also bringing the blood to the desired area. But why would we want to be able to mobilize blood and increase circulation in the first place? Well, blood is vitally important for life. It is responsible for the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide via the red blood cells and plasma, water, signaling proteins and hormones, cholesterol, glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, electrolytes, white blood cells, building block proteins, and facilitating temperature regulation and the movement of vitamins and nutrients. Even the Bible says the life is in the blood. If an area of the body is not receiving adequate or sufficient amount of blood, it will begin to dysfunction and eventually die. Some diseases that manifest in poor circulation or affect circulation are peripheral artery disease, a narrowing of the arteries, atherosclerosis, where the arteries stiffen due to plaque buildup in the arteries and blood vessels, arterial sclerosis, the thickening and hardening of the walls of the arteries, typically resulting in high blood pressure. Blood clots, which cause obstruction and turbulent blood flow. Varicose veins, which are enlarged veins caused by a failure of the one-way valves in the veins. Diabetes, in which high glucose levels cause inflammation to the endothelial lining and decrease circulation. Obesity, well, being overweight increases the risk for many other causes of poor circulation. Raynaud's disease, which causes the small arteries in your hands and toes to narrow. Osteoarthritis, the breaking down of cartilage faster than it can be repaired, frequently due to poor circulation. The list could go on, but all these conditions are either caused by or lead to poor circulation. So, in order to have good health, we must have good blood and good circulation. So, anything we can do to increase circulation and the health of the blood is ideal. Increasing circulation is also immensely helpful for recovering from injuries and surgeries as well. In this study, just applying a fomentation or hot compress to the low back increased blood flow by 156%. Significant blood flow to the upper arms was also increased. A warm bath improves blood fluidity by decreasing the viscosity of the blood and enabling it to circulate more like water and less like honey. This improvement in hemofluidity combined with the decrease in blood pressure from the vasodilation makes it much easier for the heart to pump the blood efficiently. The dermis contains so many blood vessels that when they are dilated can hold more than 25 to 30 percent of the total blood supply. This gives incredible potential for augmenting circulation, especially in contrast baths. So with all this increase in circulation and cardiac output increasing 
up to 60 to 70 percent. Is hydrotherapy safe for people with cardiovascular conditions? Yes. Clinical studies have shown that sauna therapy with high humidity was safe for patients with stable heart conditions such as hypertension, coronary disease, or stable chronic heart failure. This study of a 104 degree warm water immersion study conducted on 15 men with clinically stable coronary artery disease compared the effects of the warm water therapy to themselves exercising on a cycle ergometer on another day. The finding revealed that it was safer to be in the tub while incurring similar benefits. Even a simple warm foot bath has been proven to improve coronary flow reserve with no adverse effects on patients with coronary artery disease. The intrinsic effect of heat on the body is to increase metabolism, the chemical processes that occur within a living organism in order to maintain life. In fact, a 1 degree rise in body temperature, 1 degree Celsius that is, requires a 10 to 12 and a half percent increase in metabolic rate. This has incredible implications as far as hyperthermia and warm baths are concerned. Cold has the opposite effect, decreasing metabolism. This is why refrigeration extends the shelf life of food. However, this isn't necessarily true for both muscle and skeletal muscle, both smooth and skeletal muscle, at least reflexively. This can be easily seen when one's core body temperature drops a few degrees. A compensatory reflex such as the fuser motor drive and thermal muscle tone kicks in and you begin to, ha and you begin to shiver. The body is trying to generate heat by rapidly contracting and relaxing the muscles. The opposite occurs when one is very warm or it's very warm outside. The body does not want to generate any extra body heat, so you don't really feel like doing anything that will cause the muscles to contract. Or you could just be lazy. <laughs> this is part of the reason why blood vessels vasodilate and vasoconstrict during exposure to hot and cold. Muscle and fascia are also thixotropic, which means when it, when it first is moved, it resists motion. But after the initial mo motion, the, the viscosity begins to decrease by up to a factor of 10. This is also true when it comes to thermal energy. That is why heat feels so good on an aching lumbar back or tight upper trapezius muscles. It's causing the muscles and the fascia to relax and relieve the tension and increasing soft tissue extensibility wherever the heat is applied. So blood pressure is a robust predictor of future incidences of stroke, coronary heart disease, heart attack, heart failure, and cardiovascular related deaths. Central to the pathophysiology of hypertension is the loss of arterial compliance or elasticity, which is the lack of ability for the blood vessel walls to stretch, which can have far reaching effects on multiple organ systems, including the brain, the eyes, and the kidneys. So any improvement in endothelial function is directly benefiting many disease outcomes. The endothelium, the cell layers that line the blood vessels, secrete substances that regulate blood vessel dilation and constriction, such as nitric oxide synthase. This blood vessel activity improves cardiac function. Endothelial dysfunction is characterized by a decreased secretion of vasodilators and an increased secretion of vasoconstrictors. In this study, patients with cardiomyopathy with refractory chronic congestive heart failure who were awaiting heart transplantation were giving a warm, uh, warm steam foot bath. The grade of mitral regurgitation tended to decrease and endothelial function measured by arterial tonometry significantly increased. This steam foot bath therapy may be safe and beneficial for patients with end-stage heart failure awaiting heart transplantation. As we mentioned in the beginning of this video, water has a high heat capacity and conductivity. Specific heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius is one calorie. Thermal conduction is the transfer of heat in internal energy by microscopic collisions of particles and movement of electrons within a body. So water can store and transfer significant amounts of thermal energy. Consider this, to melt one, to melt one gram of ice, 80 calories need to be removed from that ice. And to change the temperature of a liquid water while staying in that same liquid state, takes one calorie. However, to take that gram of water from a liquid to a vapor, change the state, takes 600 calories. 
These numbers, of course, depend on atmospheric pressure. This is why sweating is so effective for expelling heat through evaporation. And this is also why hydrotherapy is so amazing at manipulating body temperature, stimulating the immune system, heat shock proteins, and FOXO3 proteins. Heat shock proteins play an important role in activating receptors of the innate immune system. Heat shock proteins act as internal chaperones and provide multiple cytoprotective maintenance services in normal cells through their expression, which is multiplied under physical and heat stress conditions. Heat shock proteins provide functions essential for maintaining protein homeostasis, protein folding, refolding, unfolding, transport, and translocation. They also protect against degradation. They protect against pathological expression of transforming mutations. They are upregulated under conditions of cellular stress and protect cells from severe damage and premature death. When tumor cells are exposed to hyperthermic conditions, heat shock proteins are presented on the tumor's cell's surface, where they signal to T cell lymphocytes to be cytotoxic towards that tumor. That's incredible! So, at what temperature are these wonderful proteins triggered at? Humans are induced to make heat shock proteins when the temperature is raised to several degrees above their normal body temperature. So, 37 degrees Celsius in is body temperature. And then, to stimulate heat shock proteins, it's around 41 to 42 degrees Celsius. That's reachable. Dysfunctional and disordered proteins are a common feature in cardiovascular disease and damaged dysfunctional proteins can aggregate or clump together. Aggregation and clumping together are strongly implicated in the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and, and others. Increasing the expression of heat shock proteins prevents protein disorder and aggregation by repairing proteins that have been damaged. And in fact, animal evidence suggests that heat shock proteins offer protective uh, aspects against neurodegenerative diseases. Speaking of brain health and, and disorders, a warm water immersion bath was beneficial in maintaining brain function and homeostasis by increasing the concentration of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, a, a neuron-inducing factor. And it also reduces the concentration of cortisol, which is commonly referred to as the stress hormone. More on brain health. Exposure to cold is known to activate the sympathetic nervous system and increase the blood levels of beta endorphin and noradrenaline, and to increase synaptic release of noradrenaline in the brain. Additionally, due to the high density of cold receptors in the skin, a cold shower is expected to send an overwhelming amount of electrical impulses from the peripheral nerve endings to the brain, which could result in an antidepressive effect. Cold water exposure significantly increases activity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system. Repeated cold exposure helps to restore its normal function in chronic fatigue syndrome, and at the very least, increase net hypothalamic pituitary adrenal activity. Daily brief cold stress can increase both the number and activity of peripheral cytotoxic T lymphocytes and natural killer cells, the major effectors of the adaptive innate tumor immunity, and the immune system in general. Again, in this study, after subsequent cold exposure, we see an increase in the immune system function, specifically leukocytes, granulocytes, circulating levels of interleukin-6, natural killer cells, and their activity. Leukocytes and granulocytes and monocytes responses were augmented or increased by pretreatment with exercise and water. That water was 18 degrees Celsius. And thus, acute cold exposure has immune-stimulating effects, especially when combined with exercise. Cold water immersion reduces the nerve conductive velocity, which raised pain threshold to promote pain control. FOXO3 proteins are a member of the FOX family of highly conserved transcriptional regulators. They play important roles in human lifespan and healthy aging. FOXO3s regulate a vast number of genes that combat elements of cellular aging, such as damage to DNA, proteins, lipids, and loss of stem cell function. They also increase the production of genes that regulate DNA repair, tumor suppression, stem cell function, immune function, and protein aggregation to further mediate the deleterious effects of aging. 
Foxo3s participate in autophagy, but when autophagic mechanisms are disturbed, Foxo3s confer cellular sensitization to apoptosis, a type of programmed cell death. Following heat stress, FOXO3 proteins form a complex with sirtuin-1, an enzyme that influences aging and longevity via multiple molecular pathways. Sirtuins regulate a variety of metabolic processes, including a release of insulin, mobilization of lipids, response to stress, and modulation of lifespan. Sirtuin-1 enhances FOXO3's resistance to oxidative stress and its ability to induce cell cycle arrest. But it also inhibits FOXO3's ability to induce apoptosis, shifting FOXO3 activities away from cell death and towards stress resistance. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> One last study. This study looked at the benefits of warm water bathing for type 2 diabetics. The study subjects were asked to sit in a hot tub for 30 minutes a day, 6 days a week, for almost 3 weeks. No other lifestyle habit or dietary changes was made. All measured biomarkers improved. One patient even had to lower his insulin by 18% to prevent hypoglycemia. The average weight loss was 2 pounds, the average fasting blood glucose level dropped 23 points, and their glycosylated hemoglobin levels decreased. But in all fairness, this wasn't a large study. However, everyone responded favorably, even in the short time. Imagine all the other benefits we just spoke of in this video that they were receiving during those baths. I want to encourage you to apply some of these principles in your own life. You don't need a fancy facility in order to incorporate hydrotherapy. You can likely do it in your own bathtub or shower. In videos to come, we will be demonstrating and discussing specific hydrotherapy treatments such as contrast shower, hot foot bath, hyperthermia bath, and more. So stay tuned, and if you learned something in this video, go ahead and click that like and subscribe button. We'll see you again.